This presentation is about advocacy for the domesticated rabbit in the meat industry in Australia. The talk is based on research recently submitted for a Master's in Law and Society through the University of Barcelona and a talk given at the University of Sydney, New South Wales in 2018. I wanted to start by showing these two pictures to set the scene for the deep entrenched view of the status of rabbits as pests by society, not only the wild ones, but the domesticated ones. The photo on the left is a fundraiser for land care called the Bunny Boiler. Their invitation celebrates the rabbit as a pest. Rabbits as part of the menu were not only wild rabbits, but those domesticated ones sourced from intensive rabbit meat farms. The photo on the right is a family-run rabbit farm in Victoria, which sold domestic rabbits for meat, pets, and to the greyhound industry. The business was for sale online, so in collaboration with an advocacy group in Melbourne, Freedom for Farmed Rabbits, we bought and shut down the business, and I have been trying to rehabilitate one of the rabbits for the past year. My research objective was to analyze animal welfare applied to rabbits in meat farms and caged environments as part of a wider plan to advocate for the end of their use, starting with an end to rabbit meat farms, which is what I'll be sharing with you in this presentation. As you might be very aware, advocating for a species known as a pest is extremely difficult. To help with this, I have based my work on theory and advocacy and have drawn on the work of several authors, academics and scientists, mainly Mark Beckoff in the use of ethology to support my critique of animal welfare practices in Australia's rabbit meat industry. I have drawn on political scientist Robert Garner in what he calls an incremental approach to animal welfare reform to question what is considered morally necessary. My own overall objective is to convince people that the industry of rabbit meat is incompatible with ethological based animal well-being. And this has brought me to Henry Spira, who complements Garner's political incremental theory, but in practical advocacy. I will therefore talk to you about my analyses of animal welfare based on those academics and scientists with an end goal of a call for action. I'd like to quickly introduce Henry Spira to those of you who are not familiar with his work. Spira's activism started in the labor and civil rights movement. He was a civil rights advocate in the US, but after he read Peter Singer's Animal Liberation and started to attend Singer's lectures, he turned his attention to the animal rights movement from 1976. Spira focused mainly on institutionalized animal cruelty to highlight what was unnecessary cruelty and methods of exploitation. He is mainly known for his successful campaigns such as pressurizing Revlon and then the rest of the cosmetics industry to phase out its use of the Dre's test and other campaigns for farmed animals such as ending face branding of cattle. Spira had some major successful campaigns and documented a roadmap for what he thought would lead to successful advocacy on behalf of animals. Those were summarized in what he called his 10 key points of advocacy, which in turn can be split into the diagnosis of the problem, the prognosis of the advocacy strategy, and then a call for action. One of his key points is to focus on a clearly achievable goal, which in my case is advocating against the rabbit meat farms, and use that as a stepping stone for larger campaigns. His campaigns were always based on research, which he said often turned up internal contradictions in what large organizations say and do. Spira's analysis was always based on research using credible sources of information and documentation, which were usually files under the Freedom of Information Act. He used his, his strategy to go behind the surface of what things appear to be. With this in mind, I have used an analysis of the law to document what is currently applied to, as animal welfare standards to meet rabbits and find out what contradictions lay beneath the surface of animal welfare law for the rabbit species. Before I share my findings on rabbits in the meat industry, I would like to mention a couple of the contradictions and inconsistencies in animal welfare protection. I have analyzed animal welfare applied to the rabbit industries of pet research and meat in three states, 
because they are the most common ones and they are mostly caged industries and use one certain type of rabbit breed, the New Zealand white, which makes comparison of standards of welfare easier. An example of inconsistencies is the difference in animal welfare between rabbits in the meat and research industries, clearly not based on any science or ethology of the species. In the case of space requirements, for example, animal welfare favors rabbits in research on the surface, ideally giving them enough space for three hops, as compared to an area equivalent to an A4 sheet of paper in meat farms. Another inconsistency between those industries is euthanasia, where cervical dislocation is considered inhumane in research, but recommended under the model code of practice of intensive husbandry of rabbits in meat farms. I'll talk about this a bit later. Now, analyzing legislation, I found that rabbits raised for food fall under two separate animal welfare regimes. The animal welfare dictated by the model code of practice, intensive husbandry of rabbits, which from now on I will call, I will call MCOP IHR, and that sets minimum standards of husbandry and animal welfare while on the farm. This has been published in 1991 and not updated since. In the three states which I have analysed, New South Wales, Victoria and Western Australia, the MCOP IHR is a voluntary code only. The second animal welfare regime is animal welfare during slaughter, which is dictated by two Australian standards under the Food and Meat Acts, and they refer to the rabbit as a consumable animal. As you can see, rabbits are slaughtered at a fraction of their lifespan. The Australian standard for hygienic production of rabbit meat for human consumption and the Australian standard for the hygienic production of meat products for human consumption are the two standards of slaughter under which rabbits fall. Animal welfare in those standards is around handling and restraining animals in general. They do not define methods of killing or any stunning practices. Rabbits killed for food are removed from the protection of Animal Welfare Acts in New South Wales and Victoria and fall under Food and Meat Acts, which label the rabbit as a food animal or a consumable animal and adopt those slaughter standards either as a whole or part of. It's important to also acknowledge the lack of science within these standards. For example, although one of the standards says that animals are slaughtered in a way to prevent unnecessary injury, pain and suffering, the provisions conflict with animal welfare if we look at the science, such as the provision to remove feed 24 hours in advance, which would cause rabbits possible gut stasis and liver failure or the use of cervical dislocation as a stunning mechanism under the operation of the model code of practice, which can leave the rabbits conscious and bleeding alive for up to 13 seconds after their throats are cut. There's little consistency across jurisdictions with regards to animal welfare standards when it comes to slaughtering rabbits. In 2010, a governmental research report by the RIRDC stated that the standard of slaughter has led to a variety of interpretation and procedures and processing methods between the food safety authorities in each state. The report highlighted that different states use different stunning methods for rabbits, ranging from operating completely without stunning to other cases where rabbits are over stunned by hitting them against an object, causing blood clots and bruising. This vague notion of stunning has potentially led to the institution of practices that cause rabbits unnecessary harm and suffering and amount to what would be an act of cruelty. This is supported by the New South Wales Food Authority 2012 General Circular indicating cruel acts within a rabbit abattoir. The standards, however, have not been updated. Another part of FIRA's successful campaigning strategy was to document what is currently happening in practice to find evidence of cruelty. With SPIRA's advocacy in mind, I have assessed animal welfare under the model code of practice by comparing its provisions to video footage and photographic data of rabbits inside Australian intensive rabbit meat farms. Those were taken by animal rights charities in several farms in Victoria and Western Australia between 2010 and 2016. 
I would like to acknowledge the undercover investigations of Freedom for Farmed Rabbits and Animal Liberation New South Wales and Aussie Farms who have allowed me the use of their material. The reference point for analysis of animal welfare was the scientific study of the European Food and Safety Agency, which I will call EFSA. And it was one of the biggest scientific studies conducted on rabbit welfare and intensive farming practices in general. At this stage, I'd like to warn that the following three slides contain some graphic footage of rabbits in intensive farms. Some of the welfare issues as depicted in the photographic data were the lack of areas to hide and the lack of space to run and perform natural behavior, whereby the EFSA recommended space to move and stand up and places to hide where necessary for the well-being of rabbits as part of their basic evolutionary needs. Stereotypies are observed such as pawing at corners and repeatedly chewing the bars. This could be due to psychological issues such as the need for company of own kind and lack of any stimulation at all or ability to move. And untreated injuries and diseases were observed from commercial conditions like wire flooring and unhygienic conditions which spread disease. While people from industry might argue that those farms are from a few bad eggs, which make everyone look bad, I think the data and analyses gathered, if it does not reflect all practices in industry, at least I can say it reflects very significant problems. Most of those issues we see are legal under the Model Code of Practice of Intensive Husbandry of Rabbits. It is not only the Model Code of Practice that does not provide adequate animal welfare standards, but also the concept of the five freedoms, if investigated as it applies to rabbits in the intensive meat industry. It is shown to be unachievable. This has been the other part of my investigation. I have compared the five freedoms to current animal welfare practices and the analyses of footage. As a reference point, I have used a brief of requirements, which is an ethological study of the well-being of domesticated rabbits. Some of the main issues breaching the freedoms are the first freedom is an inadequately met, which is the freedom from hunger and thirst by ready, readily accessible fresh water and a diet to maintain full health and vigor. For example, the inappropriate quality and quantity of feed to maintain full vigor and the inability to reach food or water. The second freedom is inadequately met. This is the freedom from discomfort by providing an appropriate environment, including shelter and a comfortable resting area. For example, the restriction of the ability to move, hide and thermoregulate. The third freedom is inadequately met. This is the freedom from pain, injury and disease, but the prevention through rapid diagnosis and treatment. For example, rabbits within confined and unhygienic cage systems are prone to a range of viral, bacterial and parasitic diseases. The fourth freedom is inadequately met. This is the freedom to express normal behavior by, provision, by providing sufficient space, proper facilities and company of their own kind. For example, the restriction in movement and social behaviour lead to a complete lack of enrichment resulting in frustration, stress and psychological health problems. The fifth freedom is inadequately met. This is the freedom from fear and distress by ensuring conditions and treatment which avoid mental suffering. For example, the isolation of breeding does and bucks and the breaking of bonds are causes of stress in rabbits. Part of SPIRA's prognostic framework is to set achievable goals one at a time. My goal at this stage is to make the public aware of what rabbits go through on meat farms. This is in line with Garner's incremental approach and his theory of challenging the notion of what should be considered unnecessary suffering to drive public opinion for a reform towards the outlawing of rabbit meat farms. The main two problems are that rabbits are ingrained as a pest species in society and there is very little known about rabbits in meat farms and their applied welfare and slaughter. My research in analysing animal welfare legislation and publications will hopefully be a source of information in this area. Spira argues to take into account changing public attitudes to animals by greater knowledge of the way animals can suffer.
With that, I propose campaigns based on revealing current standards of welfare in comparison to rabbit ethology and behavior, and how welfare standards do not take into account actual well-being of the rabbits. According to Spira, campaigns should be selected on the basis of vulnerabilities to public opinion. Based on this point, I propose campaigns to, to show the similarity between com companion animals, companion rabbits, and rabbits used for food. With this, I have put out a call to the international rabbit community and have developed a short movie showing ex-meat rabbits in family situations and as companions and their transition from meat farms. I've also developed a report on rabbits in meat farms and their ethology and physical and psychological suffering to be used when talking to restaurant owners and consumers as a stepping stone to a bigger campaign based on standards of protection of animal welfare. Ethology is one of the most important weapons we have to understand and advocate for rabbits. It can become a turning point in society's views. Two very large studies on the behavior of rabbits and their welfare, the EFSA and the Brief of Requirements, on which I have based my analyses, conclude that there are no genetic differences that cause farmed rabbits to have different needs from lab rabbits or meat rabbits or pet rabbits. This is contrary to how animal welfare protection works. The real needs of rabbits, as identified by ethological studies, such as their natural behaviors and their freedoms, are shown to be completely revoked in the current animal welfare paradigm. This ethological-based knowledge has to be the cornerstone of campaigns to widen the notion of what is morally unnecessary cruelty in the treatment of rabbits. Based on current practice and animal welfare and what science is teaching us about the ethology of rabbits, welfare within the caged meat industry is not achievable. It will come as no surprise to most people that caged animal welfare is an oxymoron and as such there is a need to propose reforms. Where I move away from Spira is that I am not advocating for bigger cages as an incremental step. I do not believe there are minor steps in this industry for animal welfare, as shown by evidence of scientific analyses and practical investigations. Larger cages will not help the animals, and it is impossible to have free-range rabbit farms based on what the European Rabbit Congress says, and a former example of so-called free-range farm, which shut down north of New South Wales due to unmanageability. Also, the spread of myxomatosis and Khaleesi viruses means rabbits need to be contained in small cages. As such, if animal welfare is unable to protect rabbits in meat farms, the industry should be banned.